One. Hey, what's up? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Roll Pod, Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I'm Cody Goodwin here, and joining me today, our normal midweek staple, fellow staff writer, Mike Rodak. Mike, how you doing? Doing well. It is a pretty big week, I suppose, um, I would say for Alabama. I think I saw the a tweet floating around or an X or whatever the heck we're supposed to call them now um, on that social media site, um, that this is a pretty, I mean, obviously it's a really big game for Alabama. They play Texas a on Saturday in College Station, um, 230 kick, CBS, um, going to be a lot of fun. Both teams are 2-0 and in SEC play. The winner gets the inside track to SEC West Division crown potentially. Um, but I'm kind of curious, wanted to start here before we really get into the show, Mike. Is this like the most consequential or most important game um, in recent memory um, for Nick Saban in Alabama? Or how, how do you best contextualize what this game means? Right. Yeah, I guess that kind of came up early this week with the the bear, you know, Chris Felica tweet. And um, it's, it's like the question is the dynasty over. It, it all depends on how you define dynasty. It all depends on how you define what's the most significant game. What's the most consequential game um, because, you know, they've played in nine national title games. They played in um, I think 10 or 11 SEC championship games. I'd have to double check that number. And all those games were pretty consequential. I mean, that's you're winning an SEC title or you're not, or you're winning a national title and you're not. So I certainly think there's been more consequential games, maybe from a, um, a positive standpoint, like, you know, what is on the line to, if you win, um, this one, I think, is more about what's on the line if you lose and, and what will happen if you lose, um, <clears throat> where and that's and honestly, it's it's true for every single game this season after the Texas game. I mean, it was true for Ole Miss. It was technically true for Mississippi State, even though nobody was really you know thinking that was going to be a competitive game. Um, even if they went against A&M here, I mean, you're still talking about the same thing in two weeks against Tennessee. You're talking about the same thing in a month against LSU. You're talking about the same thing. Um, maybe going to Kentucky, you're talking about the same thing in the Iron Bowl. So I don't know if this game single-handedly is the end-all be-all, but it is a game where if Alabama does lose, then they are out of the playoff. I mean, that's, I don't, again, you can't really ever say these things as fact at this time of year, but um, it's very hard to envision a two-loss Alabama team getting into the playoff with all the history of how the committee has decided things. Um, and especially when you're considering one of those losses is a 10 point home loss, um, which will, will not do them any favors. So um, that obviously is the downside. Um, and that's, that's where they're at. And it's, it's a question of how deep do you want to get into um, the domino effect of, of what happens when, when they lose or if they lose, I should say um, it, it's a case of, you know, people are going to start questioning what the future is of Nick Saban. Um, you know, how much longer does he coach? Is he ever going to win a national championship again? All those questions, they come up after every loss to some degree, but, you know, they've grown louder as the losses have been a little bit more frequent, you know, the last couple of years. So they will only grow louder if that's what happens in this game. So that's really the consequence of this game. There's not a ton of upside in the sense that, again, Alabama wins this game. He's still all the same questions are going to apply going forward. And there's nothing that's really, um, unless they really, really win convincingly, I think there's still going to be a certain amount of doubt or a certain amount of questions about how far this team can go. I agree. I think, yeah, within the, within the context of this season, I think this game was always going to be really, really important just given the little bit of the shared history. Um, obviously, now you look at the way the season's unfolded, no margin for error for Alabama after the loss to Texas. Also, you look at the way Texas A&M has been playing lately, like it's just it seems to have ramped up more in importance, especially after Alabama beat Ole Miss and then Ole Miss beat LSU. So now LSU's already staring at two losses, both of them in conference, right? So there's, you know, the context of the SEC West is a critically important game. Um, I do agree that I think Alabama has played games of, bigger consequence or like of bigger importance, I suppose, because, you know, nine national title games, they've obviously won six of those. Um, 
but yeah, I, this game is, it's, it, I, I felt like it was always going to be a big deal. And now it's just, it seems like it's an even bigger deal, just given the context of the way this season has unfolded so far, right. In the way that, you know, I, I think the, the other thing too, is that I think this game, the winner, there's a lot of confidence for the winner moving forward, right? Because you've got the, you're basically in the driver's seat for the SEC West. Um, you know, if you're Alabama, you went on the road and you beat a very, very, very talented team. Um, you know, I know they haven't played like it in recent years. They seem to be putting all the pieces together this year. So if you're able to find a way to do that on the road, I think that inspires a ton of confidence. You know, I think in, in the similar vein where after maybe South Florida, you and I were sitting there in the press box going, um, you know, this, this team just, I, they don't look like time to readjust expectations. Right. I think a, a good win, you know, I, even a convincing win, I, I would argue just a win in general, you know, maybe you readjust the readjustment of the expectations, right? I think like Alabama, you know, that this, a, a good win over A&M on the road would put them back in that conversation of, yeah, maybe this team can do it. Maybe they can go all the way. Maybe they can get to an SEC title game and perhaps further, um, you know, and that's, you know, that's obviously if they win, if they lose, I keep coming back to no two loss team has ever made the college football playoff. And until we see it, it's just kind of fact, right? So um, yeah, I think in that sense, in the context of this season, always a big game um, and the way that the first five weeks have unfolded um, clearly even bigger now, just when you look at what Alabama wants to accomplish this season. Right. Yeah. And that's it. it we're going to have the same conversation before a lot of games this year. That's just the, the result of them losing to Texas so early in the season. Um, Cause typically, you know, this game is, is usually the first week of October. Um, that doesn't often change. And um, it, you know, they haven't really lost in September, you know, except that a 2015 loss to Ole Miss. So um, typically this game doesn't have that much consequence because it's always like, all right, you know, even if they lose, then it's still, you know, you, 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 there's no margin for error after that, but it's you're, you're kind of taking your mulligan. And that's basically what happened in 2021 is that team had won whatever it was, 18 or 19 straight games because they had the undefeated 2020 season. Um you know, they go into AM and in fact that early in that game, AM kicked the field goal. I remember the stat came up. I was tweeting it that it was the first time Alabama had trailed in a game in over a year, um, going back to the Georgia game early in the 2020 season. Uh, that's how good they were. And then they go in there and backup quarterback and Zach Calzada and a team that was Oh, was a and ranked for that game? I think they were. I'd have to double check. You know, but they had just lost two games. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of doubt about a and And by all accounts, that was a game that later in that year, Nick Saban kept going back to and saying players did not treat the week with the proper respect. They had a terrible week of practice. Um, and that was his whole rant. You know, the famous radio show rant, you know, before the Iron Bowl that year was Saban – saying when a team has two losses, everybody thinks that they're done and they're really not. They're going to play hard. So, um, you know, they went in, they played a bad game against a pretty good team and not a great team. And they still had a chance to go to the national championship game that year. Totally different circumstance this year uh, because of the Texas loss. This is the season's on the line. The season's going to be on the line every single week. So, again, I don't know if you can single this game out, but the fact that it is on the road in Kyle Field probably elevates it whereas you get helped a little bit by the Tennessee and LSU games being at home um but still I mean we're halfway through the season after Saturday but there's still it feels like there's still so much to go here and still so many um points where you know they can trip up yeah 100 percent we'll dive a little bit more into the Alabama A&M game second half of this show I wanted to spend the first half though um, Talty and I played a little bit of a different game when we recapped, um, the previous game, Mississippi state 40 to 17, when were we kind of looked at, you know, things that we liked, things that we didn't like overall takeaway. I wanted to use part of that here with you today to just kind of take a step back, take a look at what we've seen after the first month of the season. Um, so I'm going to ask, um, Mike for like your biggest takeaway after one month into this Alabama season, what's, what's kind of the biggest thing that has stuck out to you about the way the tide have played? It's kind of as expected. You know, I thought going into the year that the defense would be good, perhaps better than it was last year. Now, that's kind of where I put them. Or great, but perhaps better than next year. And they're great, but perhaps better. I mean, they were a good defense last year, despite uh, people's assertions otherwise. They were the second best defense in the SEC last year. They were top 20. 
Um, and they are probably a little bit better than that, or at least that's certainly what they had shown against Ole Miss. That's what they showed for most of the Mississippi State game. Um, and, you know, there's still seven games to play here, but that's where the defense is, and that's kind of where I expect them to be. Um, offensively, they are where I expect them to be. Um, that's that's kind of maybe even a little bit worse, to be honest. Like, I thought this offense still had enough at wide receiver to have a competent passing game. I thought they had enough talent there. Um, and I thought Tommy Reese would still, you know, be using, you know, the talent at wide receiver. And I thought, you know, maybe the quarterback play would be good enough to at least have an average passing game. It's not. It's it's not average. It's far below average. It's it's one of the worst in the country. Um, one of the worst in the SEC, definitely. And is there hope for it to get better this year? Not consistently. Like I I I think there's still there's so much erratic play from the passing game where you know the capability to have a big 60 yard touchdown is there. We've seen it. But if this team is trailing at Texas A&M in the fourth quarter, which I think they were two years ago, and you need your quarterback to lead you down the field in that environment in a short period of time where you can't just run the ball and, and you know play murder ball, I would not have confidence in this offense to do that, to string together 10, 15, 20-yard passes, three, four, five in a row, um, to, for their offensive line to hold up in obvious passing situations, for the right decisions to be made, like – there's a lot of things that would have to happen on that sort of drive that they have not shown any sort of consistent ability to do so far this year. So um, that's that's a doubt. And again, that's a huge difference from where it was a couple of years ago or even last year with Bryce Young, because that was that was his forte. Like those situations he just thrived in. And I, you know, we haven't really seen it yet, Jalen Milrow, but they've been leading in games the last couple games and so that's kind of allowed them to play that offense where it's just very tight very compact very controlled but um there's going to come a game here soon i'm sure where they're not going to be leading and they're going to have to play a different style of offense yeah and they you know we haven't seen if they're capable of doing that yet i guess the one example and even then i'm hesitant about using it was you know obviously the texas game where you know, the defense did kind of squeeze Texas enough for a 16-13 lead in the fourth quarter. And then in the span of five plays, they're down two possessions mm -hmm. um, because Texas has that explosive element. Um, the defense wasn't ready for the punch and the offense offered zero counter punch. In fact, they turned the ball over and then it wasn't until I think what another drive or two later that they were able to get back into the end zone. But, you know, and I guess the, the reason I hesitate is because I now now that Milro is entrenched as the guy. We're starting to see the last couple of weeks that they're kind of molding the offense around his strengths a little bit. And, and it's going to look a little different each week. Um, the hope is that it looks a little bit more better and more efficient. I think that maybe remains to be seen a little bit. They didn't have to do much to beat Mississippi State. Um, in fact, they threw the ball 13 times um, against Ole Miss. I thought they played pretty well. Um, you know, so what does the final version of this offense look like? Is it going to matter if they, you know, can't beat a Texas A&M, right? Um, you know, that's that be an interesting subplot to follow through the rest of this year. I agree with you, though, on the defense. Um, just week after week, they continue to prove that, you know, I don't want to call it a championship level defense, but, you know, everything it's showed us so far, you know, outside of Texas. And even then, that's a really good Texas offense with a, you know, one of the best offensive minds in college football. Um, you know, that's they, they seem to be up to the task every single week, which is, you know, if you're Nick Saban, what more can you ask for? Right. So um, I like those takeaways. What is uh, what is one thing you like about the way Alabama has played through the first month of the season? Um, I think the ability to replace the pass rush of Will Anderson was a question going into the year for me. Will Anderson's a really good player. Top three pick, um, you know, second leading sack guy in Alabama history it's not like you could just expect the same thing but we've kind of gotten the same thing um with Dallas Turner still being there but also Chris Braswell coming in and um you know they've blitzed and um I think that, I feel like they've blitzed more like I, I don't have a stat to back that up but there's especially Mississippi State game they were really bringing some pressure and uh they've been able to generate a, a pretty good pass rush outside of the Texas game um and that's it, I don't say it looks much different than than how it looked, um, you know, last couple of years with Will. I think sometimes Will, like, you could really tell when he was really good. Like he was just taking over a game. You could just watch him with your eyes every play, and, and he would win his matchup and disrupt every single play. 
I don't know if Dallas Turner's done it to that level, but the combination of all sorts of the guys out there, whether it's Braswell and Turner, the defensive line, you know, the secondary linebackers blitzing has certainly gotten the job done. Um, so that's, that's impressed me. Um, but again, you know, the defense, I, I, I touched my hand on the stove before at this time of year and I've been burned with this defense, um, you know, saying that they were, they've had it figured out. They're back to what they used to be. And, you know, then there's a Tennessee game or there's the a &M game two years ago. And, um, just, again, I've touched my hand enough to the stove. I've been burned enough where it's like, I just want to wait. And if you think back to the Texas game, you know, even after those two touchdowns, Texas had the ball for, was it six or seven minutes, just taking the air out of the ball at the end of that game. And that defense could not stop them. And there was, you know, a couple penalties too that helped. So um, we'll wait, we'll wait and see. Yeah, no, I think there's, there's reason to really like what they've done, especially from a pass rushing perspective through five weeks. Um, you know, Dallas Turner, Chris Braswell have combined for 46 pressures, according to Pro Football Focus. Um, they've combined for, I believe, nine sacks. Um, pretty good. Top, I believe, pass rushing tandem in the SEC, if not at the top, near the top. Um, but then you've also got, you know, I mean, you mentioned just the variety of guys that they used, right? Like Deontay Lawson, seven pressures. Tresman Marshall, seven pressures. Both those guys play interior. Um, you know, a guy like Jihad Campbell is turning into one of those dudes that can do a little bit of anything and everything. Um, then they've also gotten quite a bit of pressure from the defensive line this season. Tim Keenan, um, coming up through the middle, he's got 11 pressures. That is third most on the team. And last I checked like top five in the sec for interior defensive linemen. Um, so that guy's disruptive and productive. Um, Justin Avoigby's had a good season. James Smith has taken advantage of his opportunities. They've been sending guys in, you know, like Malachi Moore, Kool-Aid. They've sent in on various blitzes every now and again from the corner spots in the secondary. Um, yeah, it just, it seems like it's, it's a collective team effort to orchestrate the pass rush a little bit. And then they occasionally will have those plays where sometimes it's just Turner and Braswell just kind of pinching and getting home and Keenan comes up the middle and, you know, the four or five guys that they send do the job. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the one thing that's also been really consistent for the most part, I think, and, um, you know, again, we'll probably say, I think this is one of the things that I'm kind of watching for this weekend run defense, I thought has been very, very good. Um, you know, I know, I think they, I don't know that they've allowed a hundred total yards to any single one player yet this season. Um, I think if you adjust for sacks, South Florida's quarterback hit a hundred yards rushing, um, you know, but they were able to, you know, they sacked him five times that day. So I don't know how you want to adjust rushing stats there, but they've been very good and they've played some pretty talented, you know, running backs already this season. I mean, the Texas running back seems to have found their stride after playing Alabama. Quinchon Judkins from Ole Miss struggled quite a bit. And then he put on a show last week when Ole Miss and LSU were going back and forth. I know Mississippi State has a running back on offense who does a lot. I mean, he carries a lot of the load for them offensively. Um, Alabama seemed to shut him down in terms of like total production. I know he still had a pretty good yards per carry average, but um, you know, the run game, I think the, the run defense, I think has been, you know, maybe, you know, as much as I love pass rushers, the run defense, I think has just, it's been very steady. It's been very consistent so far for Alabama. Um, you know, and then you combine that with the aggressiveness that they've got in the pass rush. I think that's just really helped the whole machine move forward. So um, I agree. I like the way that the defense has played. Yeah, and run defense has definitely gotten better. I'd say from the second half of last year, it was a little bit of an issue. The Auburn game uh, was the most yards they've ever given up under Saban. The Ole Miss game um, two weeks before that was not great either. Um, Justin Boyby being back, you know, from his injury, his neck injury last year, I think has definitely helped in that regard. Um, you know, I think they've gotten a little bit bigger at inside linebacker. You know, uh, between Lawson and Tresman Marshall compared to what Henry Toe Toe was, I think that helps a little bit. Um, and the overall defense is just more experienced, I think. Um, so it's, it's, that's definitely better. And I don't know how much AM is really going to challenge them in that regard. You know, they're, they're leading rushers, Le'Veon Moss. Um, they also have Amari Daniels, both averaging around six yards to carry, which is good. Um, you know, it, it's probably not the same as what it was <clears throat> two years ago with Isaiah Spiller and, um, and Devon A. Chain, who, broke off a big um, kickoff return in that game for a touchdown. You know, the big test, I think, is going to be um, Tennessee, to be honest, um, in a couple of weeks, rushing-wise. Jalen Wright is averaging over seven yards a carry. Uh, Jabari Small is averaging six yards a carry. Dylan Sampson is almost seven yards a carry, six touchdowns. Like, 
at Tennessee offense runs fast. They also run pretty well. Um, you know, one of the better rushing offenses out there in the SEC as they've kind of changed and morphed. So um, you'll have to see, you know, a couple of weeks how they do against that. 100%. Um, last thing on kind of our step back um, look at the first month of the season. What is one thing you did not like about the way Alabama played through the first month of the season? I feel like I have an inkling on what you're about to say, but I'm curious. I, I think the offensive line is, is going to be, it has to be the start of anything um, because that's, been a disappointment it's been an ongoing thing where it's it's gotten better to some degree but still the overall play out of the offensive line I don't think is kind of what we expected going in um where they're just dominating and you know they're I'm looking right now at the overall rushing numbers for the, the country Tennessee's fourth in the country at 231 rushing yards a game Alabama is not even not. in the top 50 <laughs> uh, in fact, let me keep going down here they're at 54 at 167 yards a game averaging only four yards a carry um which i don't have the exact number on where that lands but it's in the bottom 50 of the country so that's not what we expected going in um and that's only half of it the other half of it is the passing game and uh the pass protection and the amount of sacks that they've given up which i believe is almost as many as last year um how are they two or three off at this point yeah they've given up 20 through five games this year they gave up i believe 22, 22. all of last season right so. so let's start with that but obviously it's more than that it's um you know the ability to give Jalen miller a time Jalen miller's ability to get rid of the ball that's something that nick saban's kind of linked together as you know both both have to get better um so i mean whether you look at the offensive line in terms of pass blocking or in terms of run blocking, big disappointment um, in either case. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and to to be fair, believe Pro Football Focus tracks kind of which offensive linemen are responsible for which sacks. And I think we'd be um, surprised, or maybe at least I was surprised when I found this out. Of the 20 sacks allowed, they've only attributed 11 to the offensive line, um, which, you know, you think back to the last game against Mississippi State, all four of those sacks – you know, I would argue in real time, and it kind of confirmed it on the rewatch. All of those were on Jalen Milrow. Like, one, get rid right. of the ball. Two, like, don't run to the sideline when you're five yards behind the line of scrimmage. Like, find a way to get rid of the ball. Um, you know, just like little things like that. But, you know, like that's, you know, so that's going to make the offensive line look worse than it is. But, yeah, I agree. Like, they really rough start. They seem to be figuring it out. Um, especially uh, true freshman at left tackle, Caden Proctor. He has only allowed, I believe, three pressures the last two weeks after allowing four sacks through the first three weeks. Not great, um, but clearly steps in the right direction. I believe that the use of tight end on the left side of the line, um, which we've seen a lot more consistently through the last few weeks, has helped him. Um, I think having Tyler Booker back the last couple of weeks at left guard has helped him quite a bit. Um, but I agree. I still, you know, for – there's nowhere to go but up when you start as poorly as they did through the first few weeks. And so like, yes, they're getting better, but like they're still probably not where they need to be um, or at least where the final polished best version of this offense looks like, you know, like that the offensive line is nowhere near close to that yet. Um, so I agree. That's, that's been a really frustrating thing. I think I even said at a couple of press conferences that like, I'm sick of writing about how bad the offensive line is. I'm ready for them to do something good or to at least write about something different. Um, so yeah, that's uh that was kind of our step back. Um, now we can kind of take the rest of the show to look at Alabama A&M. Um, so I'm kind of curious. Uh, we obviously touched on kind of the stakes at the beginning of the show, but I'm curious for you in terms of actual gameplay, Mike, what's like, what's the biggest thing you are going to be watching for on Saturday after kickoff? The offensive line. <laughs> <laughs> where, you know, where has been the biggest issue and what A&M is probably best at defensively is, their front seven um, and their defensive line. And that's where, you know, they've collected a, a lot of talent, Walter Nolan, um, Shamar Turner, Shamar Stewart. Um, there's, there's some good players along that, that defensive line. And that's something that Nick Saban's been talking about all week in terms of their ability to create pressure. Granted, it's something pretty much every week Saban's been talking about this year, um, whether it's been scheme or the actual personnel, but this personnel is probably other than Texas. Uh, the best front seven that they're going to see uh, or have seen so far, I should say. So, um, again, and, and <laughs> we saw it last week with the snaps in that environment. Um, that was 60,000 fans in Starkville and place was half empty by the second half. And 
uh, you know, I guess there's the cowbells, but you know, there was issues with hearing the the snap count, and you know, we had the miscommunication between Milro and, and McLaughlin that ball hits Milro right in the chest. Um, Kyle Field is loud. Kyle Field is huge. There's 105,000 people there. Um, they're going to be jacked up for this game, and it's um, you know, the communication, the ability to not make those sort of errors is is going to be paramount for this line. So that's that's where it starts. You know. It's cliche to say it starts up front, but I think for this Alabama team in particular, it does. Uh, because, again, they need a sort of game where they they build some sort of early lead. Um, you know, you have a drive early in the game where you methodically go down the field and you kind of quiet the crowd. You have a stop on defense. You have another ball controlling drive on offense. You get the lead. Um, you get the crowd out of it. You don't turn the ball over. What you don't want is what happened two years ago is you fall behind and then you're, you're playing catch up the entire game and you're sitting in shotgun with three wide and trying to throw the ball and they're just teeing off on you. And that's that's not going to work for this offense at all. So they need to you know make sure they have a really strong first quarter, first half in the heaven this year for the most part. Like the offense was probably at its best first half against Mississippi State. And even then, those first two possessions were bad, um, you know, with the sacks and. Um, the second one ending on the, the bad snap. So they have not started well in really any game this year. Um, and that's that's something that's going to need to change. Yeah, no, and I think the, you know, along the same lines, I think, what you know, the the biggest thing or biggest key I guess I'm looking at is uh, is Jalen Milrow. Because um, last year, you know, he made his first career start against A&M, kind of thrown into the fire a little bit. It wasn't nearly the vaunted A&M defense that they'll probably see on Saturday. I know that they were dealing with a lot of injuries the last couple of years to a lot of those superstar recruits who have now turned into some really, really good players for them. Um, you know, how much have you grown, right? Like how much like how much better of a player? I, I think we can all agree that this is not going to be the same Jalen Milrow that played against them last season, but um, I think this will be a major test of – you know, kind of where he's at. Like this could be a big, I don't want to call this a prove it game for him because I know Saban's gone on the record and said that he has nothing to prove. But I think in the greater scheme of where this Alabama team wants to go this season, can Milrow take him there? Like this right. could be the game that shows us if he can or if he can't, you know? And I think, you know, the, the A&M's pass rush is insane. Um, you know, and when you talk about just where are the strengths here, like their biggest strength is against Alabama's biggest weakness, right? With the pass rush and the offensive line you know, how much can Milrose playmaking ability be a difference? How much can he impact the game for Alabama? Cause I think there's, you know, I think we've seen the last couple of weeks, he's, he's a lot more comfortable with using his feet as a weapon, um, not just tucking the ball and running, but we saw a couple of times last week too, where he looked like he would tuck to kind of manipulate the defense a little bit. And then, you know, he was able to pull the ball back out and throw the ball. And, you know, he wants to be a throw first guy, but I think he's starting to get a lot more comfortable with, oh, if I can use my legs to really, you know, change up what I'm seeing defensively. And that opens up maybe some windows here and there, whether that means him running or him throwing the ball. Um, you know, we're going to have to see that, a lot of that, I would think, um, in a very successful way for Alabama to really have success mitigating the pass rush of Texas A&M. And so I'm just really curious to see how he plays, how Alabama, how, you know, Saban and Tommy Reese use him, you know, is, are there more design runs? Do you get them on more rollouts? Like what's, what's the plan here to just try and keep those guys away for another second or two so that they can try and execute the offense. And I think I, this could be a big Jalen Milrow game. This could also be a game where if he plays anywhere remotely close to the way he played last year, um, it could be a and M not quite in a runaway, but in a pretty decisive victory. Um, so I, Kind of curious to see how he's going to play. I, I think his his play is, I mean, it's important every game, right? Because he's the quarterback, but especially in a game like this where they need him to show all the growth that he's made in the last 12 months. Um, super important. Can they get the screen game going? I mean, that was sometimes to fans chagrin, a big part of the Bill O'Brien offense. And, you know, they had personnel last year with Jameer Gibbs out of the backfield. It was kind of that safety valve. You know, you, you have pressure, you have a an odd man blitz and, uh, you need to hot read a guy out like Jameer Gibbs was kind of the guy that Bryce would just kind of give it to. And you could get seven, eight, nine, ten yards of carry or 10 yards after that catch just from, you know, that the ability that he has. I don't know if they have that guy in terms of after the catch ability at running back. Um, you know, McClellan and, and Roy Dell don't have the same speed as Gibbs. Um, I don't think Jam Miller really does either. Um, but, you know, can you use one of your running backs in that way if, if you are facing some pressure? 
Um, can you use one of your tight ends in that way? Like, I don't know if a four yard dump off to Robbie Oots is going to win this game, but if it prevents you from getting sacked, then maybe it helps. Uh, can you use wide receivers in the screen game? Again, I, I don't know if they have – you're not giving the ball to Jalen Waddle on the outside and having him run 50 yards after a screen, but you, you have some guys out there that you know could get a first down if, if Miller needs to get rid of the ball quickly, which I think is going to be a big key to this game is him not holding on to the ball. Um, and maybe that doesn't – or maybe that means they're not throwing it down the field quite as much. But, again, I think if you have some guys, Isaiah Bond maybe – Kobe Prentice, who can get some yards after the catch on the outside. Uh, maybe that's where you do your damage offensively. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you kind of just hit on it there, but my next question for you was going to be, what does success look like for Alabama's offense? I know we hit on the offensive line quite a bit. I just went on a rant about Jalen Milrow. You talked about setting up screen game, getting the receivers involved. Um, you know, but I, I, when you think about, you know, what, what does Alabama need to do or, or what do, you know, what kind of markers do they need to hit in terms of, you know, being effective against this A&M defense? Like, where do you think, do you think the screen game is kind of the only way, maybe not the only way, but maybe one of the more effective ways they could attack A&M's defense or, or what else are you thinking in terms of offensive success for Alabama this weekend? Yeah. I mean, you could try that. You could try, you know, riding the blitzers outside and have Milrow run up the middle. Um, you kind of have some you know delayed design runs in that regard to try to keep them honest. Um, I mean, there's schematically different things there. I think what's going to help the offense the most is what's been helping them in the past year, which is a the defense and b special teams giving them good field position um, and points. You know, as, the, as was the case last week. So if James Burnup has a big game, in which he's one of the best punters in the country this year, then that really sets up the offense so where they're not backed up and not trying to have the weight of the world on their shoulders, which again, I don't know if this offense is capable of handling that. Um, but it's the same thing I said earlier. It's get a lead, have long sustained drives, hold the ball, don't turn it over and just try to keep it under fairway. Um, that's, that's kind of what this offense is. That's kind of what this offense needs to do. And again, I don't have a ton of faith that they would be able to, dig out of a hole if they do happen to get in one pretty early. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's totally fair. Almost like a, not quite joyless murder ball, but like suffocate ball a little bit, you know, just right. like try to try to hold the ball for 40 minutes, if only to keep, you know, their offense off the field. Not that I think their offense is super, you know, it's not this mo it's not a super daunting like unit in terms of points scored and yards accumulated, but like they are in the top half of the SEC in virtually every offensive category. Like they're a pretty competent offense. They obviously when they had Connor Wegman, they were throwing the ball a little bit more effectively. Um, with Max Johnson now a quarterback, um, obviously running the ball a little bit more. They're still able to throw it around the yard a little bit, but seems like they're focusing a little bit more on the run game. What do you think the defense has to do in terms of you know, finding success against a and Like, is, is it just a matter of playing the cards that they have been playing or there's, what, what do you think specifically they need to do on Saturday? No, I don't think it's anything totally different. I think Evan Stewart's going to be their main focus and stopping him. And, um, yeah, you know, again, it's, it's never really one guy that's, that does that in Satan's defense, but, um, he's, he's really the guy. I mean, Anaya Smith, um, has done some things against him the last couple of years. So between him and Stewart, it's, it's the ability to keep them contained. I, I don't know, you know, does Bobby Petrino have the same tricks up his bag as Steve Sarkeesian did in terms of getting these guys open? But this is probably going to be, you know, the best wide receivers that they'll play outside of Texas. Um, unless I'm forgetting somebody, I think that's, I think it's a fair statement. I mean, Evan Stewart. In terms of duo, yeah, because there's, I mean, they still mm -hmm. got Malik Neighbors coming with LSU and, you know, I don't know if he has a primary running mate. I know Mason Taylor's pretty good at tight end, but right. yeah, no, I think I think that's fair, especially given like Anaya Smith is seems like he always saves his best game for Alabama. <laughs> yeah, he's had what four touchdowns, two hundred yards against Alabama the last two games uh, that he's played against. And I'm looking at Evan Stewart's numbers last year: eight for one hundred six, um, averaging thirteen yards a catch and a forty-three yarder. So yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely it's a big task for for terry on and, and for kool-aid on the outside um for malachi you know because you might see an i smith in the slot um 
and it's you know it's like any other defensive game it's not just a secondary it's not just a pass rush it's the combination of both of those and how do they you know pair off together there yeah i think the the other thing that i have found a little interesting is that um texas a&m kind of quietly um minus four in the turnover margin which leads me to believe that there are going to be turnover there's going to be takeaways that can be had here and if Alabama wants to win this game, defense has to take advantage of that in some capacity, whether it's forcing a fumble and recovering it, finding a way to pick off Max Johnson, which they've done previously. Um, you know, he used to play at LSU. He was at LSU before he came to a and He's the rare fourth year redshirt sophomore. Um, shout out COVID. So he, you know, in the two previous matchups against um, Alabama, he's been sacked. I think I combined like six times. He's thrown a pick. He's fumbled the ball. Like, you know, whether it means getting to the quarterback or just finding a way to rip the ball out, um, you know, I'm not saying that do, you know, do it out of desperation or do it on the very first possession, but, you know, just the way A&M, it just track record shows that there's going to be takeaways available um, and Alabama needs to take advantage of that. Uh, maybe give the offense a short field, uh, maybe take one back. Um, you know, I'm not saying that they need to pull another Chris Braswell, but like I think the opportunity could be there potentially. And if Alabama is able to take advantage of it, I think they could flip the game. Um, you know, maybe not in a crucial moment, but maybe in a crucial moment. You know, either to maybe set the tone or or flip the the energy of the thing. Um, you know, that's that's another thing that I think the defense needs to keep their eyes open for is that they seems like a And M not super careless, but careless enough that it's like, hey, pay attention to this. It could it could obviously be a benefit to Alabama. Yeah, and that's something that they didn't do very well last year in the entirety of last season um, was forced turnovers. And uh, they that's, you know, in terms of where the defense has been better, that's certainly been the case this year. Some of those Mississippi State game, Will Rogers was kind of just by the end, just throwing it up there and not to take anything <laughs> away from Caleb Downs. But I think I remember there was a play in the fourth quarter where it was obvious, like, fourth down situation like Mississippi State was trailing by three touchdowns with seven or eight minutes left and um it was third down and where Will Rogers throws an incompletion kind of goes to the sideline he's thinking like ah like I've, I've given up here we're gonna punt and one of his coaches had to li literally physically turn him around and put him back on the field for fourth down while well, he runs back out there on fourth down just throws it up and I think that was Caleb Downs's pick if I remember correctly um it just it just a defeated man uh, and four <laughs> through what eight interceptions and uh, three of those I think came Saturday night. So, uh, yeah, again, you don't want to totally take it away, but um, it's just sometimes some of those turnovers are just they're just there. Like if you don't have yeah, them, um, you know, it's it's a missed opportunity. Other turnovers are like, man, you're really you're forcing that one. Like you're you're making the play. Um. And so I'm looking uh, at Max Johnson so far because I have not looked specifically at his stats. Um, he's been fairly competent so far. I mean, he's played, what, a game and a half, so um, not a ton had, of time. I guess he's, he's, he's played a little bit more of that, but I guess as the starter, game and a half. So he's had one of those picks. Wagman had two um, on 119 attempts. So – yeah, it's I don't know if it's a necessarily turnover prone team, but yeah, there could be um, some opportunities there where, again, sometimes the ball just comes right to you. Sometimes you have to make the play, but um, either of those cases, yeah, it could be there. Uh, looking at what four fumbles lost, seven total turnovers, minus four is the ratio. So they're. Mm -hmm. Haven't yet maybe figured out how to take the ball away, but they're clearly giving it away, um, at least through the port. Not a ton, but like, you know, negative four through five games. Maybe something that Alabama could be able to take advantage of. Okay, last question I think I had for you regarding this matchup. Um, how do you think it goes? How do you think this ultimately plays out? What do you think happens? I don't need a final score, just kind of curious, curiously. What do you? How do you think it ultimately goes? Yeah, so, I mean, I think I said this earlier. There's a lot of games this season where I legitimately will walk into the building saying, I don't know what's going to happen. And that's different than what usually was the case my first four years covering this team where, um, with the exception of maybe two or three games, you're like, Alabama's going to win. So, again, this applies to 
this applied retroactively to the Texas game. This applied to the Ole Miss game. It's going to apply to games going forward this season. I don't know. Um, personally, I do think AM has enough weaknesses. And we're talking about an unranked team here, too. It's not like we're talking about, you know, the number one team in the country that I think Alabama is capable of winning this game. And if you had to put a gun to my head and say, do they win this game? I would probably still say yes. Um, even though they're in a tough environment, even though there's all the questions about the offense, I still think this is a game against an unranked team that you should still be winning. Um, and that's, again, I, I don't have a lot of confidence either direction on anything I predict about this team this year. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a ton of confidence in saying that, but my gut still says that they pull this one out and they live another week. And again, we'll have to see what happens. There's a lot more to go after this, but I do think they win. Yeah. If they don't win, we're going to have a really, really, really late Saturday night. Um, just churning out, you know, what does it mean? What, what do we know going forward? This, that, and the next, um, trying to calm the board down. We'll see. We'll see. I agree with you though. I think, I, I think Alabama finds a way to pull it out. I don't know what the score is, but I, I feel like in my gut, Defensive slugfest in some capacity. Bet the under if you're into such things. Um, I don't know. I just I feel like there's going to be a lot of stalled offenses. If you like really good defensive play in this game, I think this is going to be the game for you. Um, but I also think Milrow's ability to make plays with his feet is going to make enough of a difference for Alabama to pull it out. Um, I don't know when he's going to make the big play but he's going to do it and it's going to work. And that's just, you know, 13, 10 ish, maybe. I don't know that even, that even seems too low, but that when I think defensive slugfest, I think of both teams scoring less than 20. So um, I haven't seen that in a while, but <laughs> <laughs> my, maybe my that's, son. Hey, I still coming from big 10 country. Maybe I just got things that I'm still working through. <laughs> my my um, four year old always says, I, I haven't seen that before. <laughs> I've seen that before in Alabama, thirteen ten game. It's been a while. I mean, going back um, to like twenty eleven with that. Yeah, the nine six game or something against LSU, and then they right. found the end zone two or three times in the national championship game when they met again. Um, game of the century. I personally enjoyed that game, but I also really like fun defenses. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's the show today. Appreciate you coming on again, Mike. We will be back uh, probably sometime Sunday or Monday to recap this game, whatever happens. Um, in the meantime, be sure to rate and review this show wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, even our Bama 247 YouTube page. Be sure to subscribe to Bama 247 and 247 Sports. Guys, we have a new special going on right now, $1 for two months. $10 a month thereafter for the best coverage of your favorite college team. Take advantage of that now, especially if you're an Alabama fan. Thank you again so much for listening to Roll Pod, guys. We will talk to you again soon.